All right. Hello, everyone. It's it's a Material World podcast. Uh, I'm David Ye, your co-host, alongside me, my other co-host, Puneeth. And yes, Puneeth, uh, where are you? It's quite floral behind you. <laughs> yeah, I'm at uh, the Outer Banks right now, closer to Kitty Hawk. Um, so yeah, we're going to go to the Wright Museum on Sunday. Um, but in the meantime, just relaxing at the beach, um, just kind of taking some much needed time for just walking, walking the beach and spending time with my extended family. Um, but yeah, that kind of really translates well into the theme of this episode um, in, a, in a kind of convoluted way, right? Where I liked a, a post on LinkedIn, which was a SEM image, but colorized in the form of a beach. So it was like a green, green jungle, lots of flora and fauna, then a, a sand and then water. Um, and so uh, it was very beautiful, um, but it was an SEM image at its core, right? A black and white SEM image colorized. Um, and that was the theme of this episode, right? Where uh, we brought Bubbuk on to talk about his experience with combining arts and science, specifically nanoscience. Um, but yeah, I loved the episode, but wanted to hear, David, your, your favorite parts of the episode. Yeah, I think just his love and his passion for material science was very evident and it was very similar to what we're trying to do. And so my favorite part was we talked a lot about his vision and what he wanted to get out of it. And so he started as a PhD under another person we've interviewed, Yuri, um, and he wanted to help spread the word of material science, uh, not only to the general public, but also globally. And so I thought it was very interesting that uh, we have two very similar goals, but we've approached it completely differently. And so hearing what he thought and how the globalization of science and how his nanoartography could help with that globalization by linking together different parts of the world so that we could work together in further science was all very, very interesting to me. And something I thought was a very unique perspective and something that even though that we have the same path is like two very different perspectives of the same path. Uh, yeah. What were your favorite parts? Yeah, and I hope that we can find ways to collaborate in the future because my favorite part was just his vision for what uh, this nanoartography can contribute to the recruitment of material science and engineering students, um, particularly at like the high school level, right? So imagine having like VR glasses, right? And being able to walk through a virtual art museum with nano art um, all around you and then really getting to learn about what those images are at its core um, and kind of the rationale behind coloring it in, in the way that they do. Um, so yeah, I think that would be a really good way of providing that unique value and um, differentiating MSc from other fields that high school students can enter. Um, so yeah, it was a great episode and um, make sure to like and subscribe and follow us on your preferred podcast platform. Um, we hit 1000 subscribers recently. So thank you all for um, kind of supporting us with, with that effort. It really means a lot. Um, but yeah, without further ado, let's get into the episode. Our sponsor today is Johnson Matthey. Are you a material scientist or engineer who wants to be part of the drive for a world that is healthy and cleaner, both for today and for future generations? By understanding the relationship between a material structure and its physical properties and chemical behavior, material scientists and engineers at Johnson Matthey develop sustainable technologies that are catalyzing the zero transition in transport, chemicals, and energy. They design porous materials for catalyst supports for emission control systems that remove harmful emissions produced by diesel and gasoline engines. They innovate new compositions for catalysts at the heart of the hydrogen fuel cells in trucks and buses. And they also develop new corrosive resistant reactors for processes that enable the production of sustainable chemicals and fuels. To find out more, visit Matthew.com. That's M A T T H E Y.com. Johnson Matthew, inspiring science, enhancing life. Hey, everyone. We're super excited for today's episode and to welcome Dr. Babak Anasori, the editor in chief for the new Graphene and 2D Materials Journal at Springer Nature Group and an assistant professor at the Purdue University School of Engineering. Babak holds a PhD in MSE from Drexel University during which the idea for nanoartography was born, um, which we'll uncover very shortly. So thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. 
Awesome. So we'll start out with the big question, which <laughs> is what is nano artography? Yeah, so uh, nano artography is basically a platform where we want to combine science and art in, in the most uh, visually appealing way to bring public awareness to the world of nano uh, science or nanomaterials as a whole. It is based on an annual competition. Nano artography is a competition. And uh, the competition always, uh, the submission deadline is September 30th of every year. And after that, we'll start with judging and the winners are announced in November of that year. Can you give examples of like maybe the past winners or like what was it from the nanoscience, nanotechnology perspective that makes it so visually appealing? Yes, well, um, now this year is the seventh year of nano artography. And wow. um, so we have had um, six years of, of um, you know, award-winning images. And uh, for example, uh, there we have many of them that, you know, you have uh, a feature of a material and then the, the scientists or artists see something that has nothing to do with that image. Uh, for example, um, there is one that um, has, um, I'm talking about, you know, my field of, of, you know, work, which is 2D materials. So there's a 2D material of, of Maxine and uh, the artist or the scientist turned that to a book. And, uh, you know, the idea of a book being a layered material, and you see that at the small scale, at the nano level or at the micro level, you know, that's, that makes something, you know, visually appealing and has a story behind it that you can relate to. Yeah, I'm always really impressed. I took a look at a couple of your winners, just all my samples never looked nearly that nice. So uh, just really cool that we can get down to such a microscopic view of like what's actually happening. Um, and you could, like you're saying, like get a more, uh, like a deeper story behind exactly what we're seeing, which is something which I always struggle with because it's something that we can't see with our own eyes. So it's amazing that it could be right there on our Petri dish, uh, but we can't even see it. Right. Yes. Yeah. That That's a, one of the really beautiful feature of, of this type of um, art, um, nano artography or nano art, that as you said, David, we don't see these things. And we usually use electrons because they are so small that the optics and, and uh, visible light will the wavelength is not small enough so uh, the image is all computer generated it is really the the scientist or the artist uh, imagination that turn that and see something different in that image and turn it to an art piece and it can be sometimes it can be black and white but it's just the description that comes from the imagination of, of that person that adds that you know beauty into it, that everyone can see that feature that maybe uh, to begin with, you wouldn't see it. I, I know that for a lot of images, they colorize it like some of your winners. And I think that's, it's almost like a more advanced like uh, color in between the lines because you have these <laughs> nice structures uh, and it's these beautiful features that we've somehow made. Uh, and so I just really appreciate how uh, you can meld the fields of science and art, which is not normally considered to be very similar. Usually they're at odds where you're either an artist and you're more creative or like your scientist is supposed to be more rational. So uh, maybe could you go into how you want to promote the cross promotion of these two fields, which have been at a very basic level at odds with each other? Yeah, so that is exactly the goal of nano artography, that we want to have this platform that, you know, artists and scientists and engineers, we have different tastes. And um, and uh, so when we see something even visually appealing, it might not be interesting to the artist. But if we can create something that it is you know, interesting to everyone, to the artist, then we have a way to connect to the world. So that's, that's very important. And that also was something that got me involved into this even type of competitions to begin with, when I was a PhD student to kind of like take this research that I have, my research outcome, and sometimes work with it as a piece of art to help me, you know, like um, to maybe sometimes when there is a roadblock, there is a difficulty, I, I could have done this. And I, I was doing that to make me feel better and, and uh, doing it as a hobby. 
to connect art and science. Interesting. So is that how this whole like concept of nano artography got started? Was it really just this um, this passion for this combination of art and science? Can you walk us through the origin of nano artography and how it's blossomed into what it is today? Sure. Yeah. So um, nano artography is not the first competition of, of this type of uh, sciences, art or nano art. There are many of these competitions. And in fact, when I started as a PhD student, I started using the electron microscope, the scanning electron microscope, which, as I said, use electron to scan the surface. And then I realized there are a lot of these competitions that you can submit these images if you capture them right as an art piece. And there's a chance of winning uh, in these competitions and, and all of that. So I got interested and I had I've never done it before when, when I started. So it was um, a long time ago as a PhD student. I started doing this. And um, at the beginning, obviously, my images did not win because I didn't know how to bring it to high quality. But later on, I realized how to do that. So I started choosing some of these images and add false coloring, meaning adding color from uh, photo editing tools like Photoshop and make it into an art piece and then submit to different uh, of these um, image competition. I was able to win um, a good number of, of these, I don't know, um, 20 or, or more and then another, uh, if I, I don't know, um, like cover images. And that was, you know, very helpful, not just, you know, as a passion, also something rewarding for a PhD student when you're doing, you know, you're working on a project for five years. So you better come up with things that gonna make you uh, happy throughout the whole process. And that was one of the things that I was working on. That's awesome. So what did that like growth process, you mentioned like your first images may not have been like the mm -hmm. highest quality. Can you talk us through what you learned? Like how did you develop as an artist and what, what does it mean to like, continuously improve in this space? Sure. I, I wouldn't call myself an artist. I would maybe a materials um, engineer artist or something like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, at the beginning, you know, you, you think, okay, I'm going to add colors, but then you realize there, there are more into it. There are, there are more layers of, um, like, editing that you have to really pay attention to how you draw your boundaries, what type of color contrast you add, because we as engineers or scientists, we don't have the training, proper training to even, I don't have any knowledge. Um, I try to learn, you know, like just online about how to combine colors. And that also is an, another struggle that many of us can have when we are putting a research paper together, putting the figures together, because we don't have that art background. So at the beginning, it just, you put things together because of no background and you think that this is good and you submit and see it doesn't get anywhere. Then what I did was going and look at all the award winning images, try to understand what they've done different from me that uh, made it to the top choices. For example, the contrast between the, the colors, the quality of the image, how, as I said, how to create these features that helped me to get to a better level that I was able to be recognized and, and win some of these um, image, uh, image competitions. Yeah, so you kind of already touched on this, but I just had a qu two questions for you. So the first one is, do you see yourself now or do you see people in the field that also do nano artography as more of an engineer or as an artist when you're trying to curate these images? Myself, I would say I'm a materials um, engineer or scientist scientists um, there are we have submissions from uh, more uh, people with art background and that's basically because of the growth of nano artography so most of the the submissions coming uh, are from uh, people with materials or engineering and science background that is i would say where most of the the um, submissions are coming from mostly from universities or non-university, but with appetite, interest in, um, in science and engineering. And then secondly, uh, so you describe yourself primarily as an engineer, but then secondarily, would you describe yourself as more of an artist or a storyteller when you're trying to create these images? That's a very good question. I have to think about the answer. Storytelling is essential for all of our communications. And, and I personally 
um, I always remind myself that, you know, when even when we write a paper, we write it first, and then we will go back and forth with my students. I do the same thing several times to see whether it is story or not, because if it is not a story, no matter how well you write it, you will get the reader confused. So storytelling is essential, not only for even art pieces, for anything that we do in terms of communication. So I personally believe that we all need to be good storytellers because otherwise we miss and we still have this gap between us and the public. So that storytelling is essential. Now, the art that we are doing, or the art as we call it, uh, is a tool, is one of the tools that we can use for our storytelling. So I'm going on a tangent a little bit. I'll, I'll go back to the, the nano artography in a moment, but you mentioned storytelling. And so I was just wondering if you have, based on all of the papers you've, you've read and, and written as well, do you have any tips for uh, MSE students, early career professionals, PhD students um, that are writing and trying to craft a story um, in, in the science realm? And how, how do you craft a good story um, in this space? Storytelling that we talk, so it, it depends. If it is for a paper, then uh, all we care is to have a flow in, in your story from the beginning. So it has the beginning, it has an end. What we want to do, if, if it is, for example, now talking about just writing, publication, what we want to do is to make sure there's really no jumps in our story. Meaning that when you write a paragraph, always think how you can connect your next paragraph to your previous paragraph. And that's that's the most important thing for storytelling in the scientific writing. The same way for our illustration. When we put the figures together, they're not separate pieces. You have to be able, without reading the paper, just by illustration. And that's where you know the nano orthography side of me always helped me, is how we can put the figures together and without even looking at the manuscript, see if there is a story into it. We can always move things around to make that smooth story. So that's basically by the two tips I can uh, give for uh, how to do the storytelling in uh, writing. I didn't even think about the just the figures alone, looking at them, the illustrations in a paper and crafting mm -hmm. a story through that. I really like that, uh, that concept. Um, but yeah, taking it back to the art, I just wanted to hear from your personal experiences, what did uh, that involvement unlock for you in terms of um, not just storytelling, but problem solving? You know, because mm -hmm. I would say that the vast majority of engineering students probably don't dive into uh, maybe their artistic side. So what has that unlocked and why do you think it'll be, it would be beneficial for more engineers to, um, you know, tap into their creative side? I would say I can think of a few benefits right away. So one is personal because I, I mentioned that you need to have that side hobby passion to um, basically, we talk about this with, with students, survive the five-year PhD program. Because otherwise, if you just focus on your research, there will be days that you don't achieve your uh, desired result. They're not failures, but they feel like failures. So you will have these ups and downs. And having something like that as a sign will always help you feel better and they're rewarding. That's number one. Now, as like that's just personal. As my for my research, by using these uh, nano orthography or, or these visualization, I was able to bring more attention to some of the research that we're doing. Because just think about it. If I tell you the title of my uh, next, uh, my group uh, next uh, paper, even, you know, we're all in materials world, you might not be even interested to hear what it is about. If I show you an image, visually appealing image, you might be interested at least to hear about it for the next 20 seconds, 30 seconds. So using this type of, and that's why like, you know, um, uh, showing these as one image can draw attention, even from the materials community to your research, and that can promote your research. Obviously good research, you know, the design of project results and all of that, they are must, they're required. But sometimes you might have these things, but not, you know, having that now visual piece can help you promote it even further. So that's basically one of the benefits that I got 
from, from these images. And so when we talk about these images, uh, you talked about some of these science art competitions where maybe not everything's SEM, but there's some optical microscopy and just overall like 3D printing, et cetera. Uh, what do you think makes nanoartography special and different from these other competitions that are in the material science space? Yeah, so you, David, you, you said it correctly. There are many of these, even SCM images, the same concept. What, uh, in my opinion, I try to make it unique with, with at least two ways. One is nanoartography is open. It's accessible to everyone. And having the inclusion in mind was very useful because you don't need to be a part of a society. You don't need to be a part of a university or even have a certain college degree to be able to enter. You can be anyone, anywhere in the world and submit the image. I've received emails from different people from different countries saying that this is really a great opportunity for us because we don't have this type of competition in our country. So making it open to everyone and make sure that everyone has access was is one of the unique feature of nano autography. The second is uh, that goes back to the art and science combination. So what I tried to do, and I made sure that always applies to the nano artography judging committee, the judges. I make sure I have a good combination of science, engineering, and art and communication background in my judges. And um, when I have this combination of the judges, and when they select something, usually there is a minimum overlap with all the votes, which makes my job and, and um, interesting and challenging. But when I find that there is some overlap between the votes, you know, a few images got the votes of the engineers and scientists and, and the artists, I know that those images are absolutely the ones that make, you know, most of the public, everyone almost interested to learn more. So this type of diversity that I included in the judging committee, I think, helped nanoartography to make it even more successful and, and grow naturally. We don't have any, you know, it's, it's an independent competition. So the growth has been naturally. And I think the diversity of the judges was very helpful. So since it's so subject subjective and you have these ver variety and in inputs, how do you ultimately like make that that decision or how do you judge and determine who's like winner, second place, third place, et cetera? I trust my judges. So I, I choose them based on, you know, my interaction and different backgrounds. So and uh, always the, the winning image is the image with the highest number of votes that uh, my uh, team of judges uh, usually give. And I have uh, usually about 10 judges. So it's not, you know, like one or two. So when you have about 10 judges, there's always few images with, you know, the high highest number of votes. And that usually determine, um, always determine who would be the, the winner in the first place and then all of that. And so you describe it as uh, it's unique because not only does it grab everyone from around the world, but also from other disciplines. And we've talked before about how nanoartography is hoping to serve as a gateway to get more people interested in MSC. Now that we have all these like unique perspectives and looking in, what is your philosophy about getting them interested in MSC once they start to see how cool that we can make things look underneath microscopic conditions? So the idea behind nanoartography is exactly this, to use these visualization as a hook to grab everyone's attention and that we can have few more seconds. And I say seconds because of, you know, we all have now this short attention span that it's only a few seconds. So if I, if you have that few seconds, then if they read the description and there is a chance that some of those will be interested to learn more about that type of materials. They might see it as also the application or how common all the material is in real life. You know, for example, we have images of particles of salt. So just knowing that, you know, it's it's particle of salt that looks like this can make the those interested maybe even to choose to learn more about materials and draw more people into the field of material science and engineering. Interesting. And so then from the 
from the students or any researcher or anybody who's submitting uh, this art, why is it important for them to kind of showcase their work um, in, in this fashion? So uh, what does that allow? What, what is the incentive for people to submit their work? I think we briefly touched on, on, on this, that um, the benefit that I, I got basically uh, from doing these images, uh, which is the title or a research article, we have to be technical. We must be technical because we, we dive deep in the world of materials. We dive deep in fundamental understanding. So that will not really make it to the public. You know, the title of our research papers are technical. We want to make them technical. And the content is all about, you know, the research focus. So now if either we need to write a news piece, which is totally different from what we have done. And usually that's out of our job. And that's not our job. And it's, you know, the um, communication team at the university or the company that they do that. Um, so every time you need to do that, which requires a lot of team effort and all of that. Or we can use these images as to showcase and to bring attention. And it can be, you know, a totally different um, concept, but if that draws attention and have your audience attention for a few seconds that they can read the description, they might click on the link related to that, uh, to that image that takes them to the research article and they might get interested. Um, it can be also about the research outcome. So if someone, you know, you will get more awareness about the research that you're doing, and that can even help your research progress further. And so taking a step back, uh, maybe an interesting question would be, do you think that in some cases research, especially for companies, but also in some lab groups can be a little secretive? Do you think that this gives them an outlet to show it more creatively and boost their work? Or do you think some people are holding back to not show like more intricate details about like their crystal structure or more technical concepts that maybe they're trying to skirt by in their actual paper? So yeah, that, that depends on the basically the uh, group or the group of authors or scientists submitting. But in my opinion, and we have seen it, um, the requirement for nano orthography is you don't need to disclose exact scientific background behind it. The goal here is to bring more visibility to the world of nanomaterials. So you can just mention, for example, a little bit about the materials in, in the image, and then talk about how you see the relation between your research and the real world and the image. So the goal here is to be more focused on the artistic side of, of the uh, piece, the art piece, uh, so it is a good platform, David. You you um, you suggested you brought up a good point. It is a good platform to share things that you can not share in the public domain from the technical perspective as a way that you know you still would get some exposure, but with minimal knowledge. Because the goal here is not really technicalities, just to bring you know, visual uh, pieces to the public. So I'm just curious, like what, um, are there any testimonials or results or what have you accomplished over the past six years, now your seventh year that you'd be willing to share through this nanoartography and the resulting competitions? And then what do you hope um, to accomplish in the future um, within the same realm? Yes. Yeah, so um, the first thing is um, this accessible uh, form of competition. Uh, that uh, I, I received uh, emails from um, all around the world that um, they are, you know, excited that they can be part of of this competition, and uh, they receive visibility, and they have been, you know, our, our first places from our all around the world. So the fact that you know, and that being first place, I've seen even researchers that that kind of not really change their career path, but had them exposed to more opportunities, which is the best outcome for me because, you know, nano orthography is all volunteer work. So seeing that, you know, someone who won the first place 
of nanoarthography a few years ago, and now they're doing great research in the top uh, universities. And then I, I discussed it with them and they mentioned, yeah, that really opened, you know, my vision, not really changing anything, but opening, bringing opportunity. Um, that, that is the best thing um, about doing this job for me to see these things that happen because of their participation in this international competition. Now for future, uh, what I have uh, in mind, obviously I want the nano autograph to grow. And we, we have seen this growth over the past uh, seven years. It started from a local small uh, competition with really no background. Now we have uh, about 200 submissions per year. And uh, now I want it to go grow even further. Now, uh, and I want to build upon this accessible and openness of nanoartography. So one thing I want to do is right now, um, it is open to everyone, but still you need to have this microscopic images to enter. So what I envision and I plan to do not immediately, but in the long term is to create a repository that the scientists who capture these images, they can put it in, in that um, basically shared environment. And those who have interest in creating art, they can have access to them and they can be you know, the, on the opposite side of the planet. And they then they can basically enter the uh, competition together. So we are connecting two uh, groups of, of people that probably they would never interact without the competition. So that's one. If I can, I can accomplish that, that would be another huge advantage unique feature of nano autography. And the other one that I have in mind, and that will require even more work, we do right now local art galleries based on nano autography, and they're very popular and interesting because we connect, again, the scientists, the artists, all different backgrounds. But I want to do this also internationally. And uh, one way is to travel around the world and do that, which costs a lot. But the other way is to create a virtual gallery, an immersive virtual gallery that anyone, you know, with a phone in their hands, they can basically get into this gallery and create this uh, virtual reality, augmented reality gallery to learn about nanomaterials, learn about the world of materials. And by just looking at these pieces, and then they can go one level after another to learn more about the materials or even enter a virtual lab of materials. Just imagine how much more we'll have in terms of future scientists coming to the world of materials if we can create this virtual environment. So that's another goal. If we do that, you know, we might bring talented students, talented kids that probably they would never get into materials. But just because of this interaction, then now they're interested in materials. They're going to you know, enter the materials field, they might be the future Nobel laureate. That otherwise, they would have gone to another career path and they will do well, but not really benefiting the community, the society. So that's the ultimate goal also for me. So it sounds like you're almost describing like globalization of science by trying to connect people all over the world. Beyond getting more people into the field, what other advantages do you think globalization could have on like the field of science in general uh, and like kind of like your aspiration to keep on pushing further and further? Absolutely. That, that is essential for any advancement in science and engineering, because when we connect people around the world, we bring new or different ideas together. And that's essential for brainstorming for new ideas. So this connection of, of different people around the world can ignite new ideas in their, their minds and they can pursue that and maybe achieve something that otherwise would be impossible. So this basically cross the world collaboration is another way and that is essential. If you wanna really achieve what we are right now aiming for, if you wanna really go beyond what we have in the world of nano, in the world of materials, we need to connect, we need to have really no border in the way we are, we are thinking, which is thankfully with all the publications, it's all open, accessible. That right now we have this platform, but sometimes you don't have this connection. So when you, you go and look at an art, 
you might get exposed to something that otherwise you would not be exposed to because you know materials world is massive right um so it can be you know i work on nano but it is more on like structural not bio so i have little knowledge about bio but maybe by seeing that piece of art i get interested i contact that um, scientist and we might establish a new way of collaboration and that can lead to you know new advancement in science and, and on the topic of globalization and art in general when we think about more like uh, like realistic or not realistic but more traditional art um there's been a lot of advancements in technology especially on like the blockchain and the hype around crypto with nfts um which are like trying to digitalize art how do you think that the way that you will you like you're talking about ar and vr galleries how do you think the um communication of art is going to change in the next 10 years and how is nano artography trying to shape their approach to these pictures in the future sure um so i'm, I'm not the most expert uh, in the communication of art but from my perspective yeah I, I i believe that it will be more in the virtual world because uh, one thing that we all learn is you know virtual learning is not only video learning we cannot have this human interaction when we change everything from in person to virtual, just calling virtual a video call. So we need to have more interaction. And the only way we can do that as, as like one world is through virtual world. And that means virtual reality, augmented reality. So in my opinion, I think we will see more. And I know that, you know, there are a lot of advancement in the world of augmented reality. Well, so we'll see more of that. And that's why, uh, and art probably will go in that direction. There has been several successful immersive virtual galleries, not sciences art galleries, but general art galleries. So what? that's why I want to be ahead of the game also for the science and art and nano artography and design this uh, type of um, immersive virtual um, virtual reality because when you say virtual everyone everyone think okay it's on on your phone but no really immersive so i think that that's the direction that we are heading and we have we all have to think about it even from the education perspective we have to think how we can provide education in the materials world or anything related to stem in this direction the virtual reality the augmented reality way yeah, this is so exciting because I feel like our goals are, are very similar. Like with the podcast, we originated it because we wanted to uh, share the world of material science in a different light and try to explain like the fundamentals and the impact. Um, and then, you know, if they choose to follow a career in MSc, they can really dive into the theory. Um, and it seems like I'm just imagining right now, like uh, the next generation of MSCs, like high school students, right? They can put on like the Oculus, right? Or like some some VR glasses and then they can really just walk through a gallery of uh, nano art everywhere. That's what I'm imagining. I think that would be really, really exciting, really cool. Yeah, I, I fully agree. And I, I believe that that is, that is the future and uh, hopefully that will bring more visibility to our field of material science and engineering that uh, we'll get more of, of these talented kids into our field. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah, if you compare it, like <laughs> if, if you have ME and then Kemi and then MSC has this like VR gallery, of course, <laughs> we're going to get more MSCs for sure. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And I feel like with all these imaging, like tomography, we can do 3D renderings. And if, we're, if we could ever walk through it, I could actually see the bonds. I feel like that have been very mm -hmm. helpful growing up because sometimes it's hard to visualize the concepts we learn in MSC. Like I, I'm still not a thousand percent sure if I understand band gaps, but um, <laughs> I, I just think that visualizing these things like Emmy, it's like a motor. We can understand motors really easily. could also help the draw of MSC as like a more understandable and approachable subject. Yes. Yeah. That, that, that part of education, I, I believe that we all need to think about we all need to work on, on that. And it is not straightforward because we don't have the proper training. Me, for example, I have all the training in material science and engineering. So we need to really go outside our comfort zone. We need to connect with our colleagues in different departments to create this type of platform to make 
you know, what we're explaining, as you mentioned, like how atoms interact or band gap or, or any of, of these things, the electronic structure, in a way that when you explain it the first time, there is a resource available that the student can go and learn it the way that they can understand. Yeah, for sure. I think we that's one of our like long term visions too. With this podcast, is like this is just one form of content, right? But we're we're hoping to share like short form videos or shorter YouTube videos, blog posts, things like that, just because people consume information in a lot of different ways. So I think we're very much on the same page there. And if there's room for collaboration in the future, that would be exciting as well. Um, but yeah, I'm just curious. Uh, are, is there video as part of this like nanoartography competition currently, or what does that look like? What could it look like in the future? So right now, nanoartography is all about imaging and there is no video. Um, I, I started a video competition um, that uh, it was very successful, but um, again, for, for many reasons of basically time, resources and all that, um, we put that on hold, and that is called SciVid, Science in Video Competition. Um, and um, so that will require more effort. You know, uh, I, I want to create a platform that, you know, like you're busy, but still you have, you can dedicate one hour to create this piece of art and submit and, and bring visibility to your research. Creating a video, as I think you both know better than me, takes a lot of time. Um, Scivit, uh, you can Google, you can YouTube, you see that they're all really beautiful um, work of just material scientists, material engineers, students um, that they put together in two minutes. So the goal of Scivit was to create a two minute video competition to promote material science and engineering. And uh, you will see beautiful videos. It takes more time. But uh, that is another platform that we can certainly come back and, and uh, expand upon that to bring more visibility. The goal is to populate the internet, either uh, imaging or videos with materials related to the field of material science and engineering that um, hopefully people without any background, they get to know the materials. So that can be one way of a video competition, which we have done before. So just to kind of conceptualize it, what are, can you give some examples of those videos? Are they like time lapses of like a reaction occurring or, or what are some examples of those videos at Simon? So yeah, the, the way we put it together, I, I put the requirements was just to create a two minute, you know, like those YouTube videos that you just start, you want to continue watching it. So it is less, again, technicality. We don't want to, it's not a chemistry. It is not a chemistry video that describes a reaction, describes how the material is made. So obviously one thing that everyone can relate to is an application. So all of these, they have some sort of application. All of the winners, they have some sort of application, starting with that application at the beginning, ending with that application um, to make it clear to the public. And obviously other um, aspects of making a video, you know, proper way of, of capturing the video uh, and more visually appealing, you know, um, even one of the suggestions I put, like maybe, you know, drones are very accessible, like use a drone to capture, you know, a better video in the lab, outside the lab and all of that. So, um, you, so those are like, basically, it's a, again, less technicality and more about how we can communicate your research in the easiest way possible and the most you know, exciting way possible. And we had the requirement also to end it, uh, end the video by saying that, and um, material science and engineering makes it possible. So <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Great, well, after speaking with you, it's very clear that we share very similar goals, such as bringing awareness to MSC, inspiring young professionals or even people in high school to follow in the MSc field. From your perspective, what do you think the best thing for a young material scientist or engineer can do to set them up for a fulfilling and successful career? Uh, so yeah, David, I, I'm glad that you mentioned fulfilling career because success is relative. You know, you can define it. We're all successful one way or another, but fulfilling career is very important. So in my opinion, you know, for, for someone who is at, 
um, say, a first year freshman of material science and engineering. Um, I suggest to get involved in research in a lab because then they can uh, identify which area of research they like to do and which area they do not like to do. Then you, they will have a better focus on, okay, this is the area that I want to work on. Whether they want to do grad school or not, it will help them focus basically to, a, to an area that they like to do. Also, doing that research will bring more opportunity for internship, even outside the university, in a company, in a national lab, or maybe inside the university. And then they basically, without really trying it as a job, as a permanent job after graduation, they have all these experience and exposure. So that will help them also decide which environment they want to work in. With all of these, then hopefully they can identify like, this is what I want to do that when they start, they can choose a career path that make them happy and excited. Because, you know, we all talk about work-life balance. And uh, well, as a university professor, maybe everyone knows that I, I don't have a good work-life balance. But what I, I always say, I don't think that it is the right terminology of work-life balance, in my opinion. Because if you think about it, we are we will be working from age maybe 15, you know, like uh, some part-time job all the way to 65 or all the way to 90, age 90. So at least about 50 years of work. Why we want to call that a separate thing from living? We are going to put a big portion of our lives into work. So we better find a way to live that, to enjoy that. So yes, obviously family and personal and work balance, that is important. But work life, I don't think, I think you need to, we all need to find a work. We need to find a job that we can live, that every day we say, okay, this is what I want to do for the rest of my life. And I enjoy that. If we can find that, no matter what you do, whether you, you start your own company, you go work in a company, in a national lab, in a university, anywhere in the world, you will have a fulfilling career and you will be successful. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I'm happy that I at least followed that path that you recommended. You know, I got involved with research after or during my freshman year, David did as well. And I think mm -hmm. that really played a pivotal role in setting us up for future research opportunities as well as internships. And then we could really, um, we went down very different paths, yeah. David and I, but um, we found uh, like our, what, what, was fulfilling for us. So I totally agree there. Um, and love the point that you made about work-life integration. Um, so with all that being said, maybe we can wrap up this episode with um, your you know, call to action. Can you talk about the nanoartography competition, the deadline, and um, where people can go to uh, learn more about it and potentially submit their work? Sure. So before we, we do that, I have to um, mention one thing that uh, David, you asked about the start of nanoartography, and that also goes along with the, the advice to the students, is that the start of nanoartography was during my postdoc. And uh, at that time, I was working with um, Yuri Gogasi, as I mentioned. And I, one day I went to him and I said, I want to start this competition. He could have said, no, why you want to work on something that has no benefit for your research? You're supposed to write paper, do experiments, write proposals, and then do all these things. Why you want to do that? But instead, he said, you have my full support. And uh, I said, what resources do you want me to provide? I told him, all I need is just your support. I will raise the fund needed and, and all of that. And um, thankfully, being successful it is self-sustained. But... I still have the support of, of Yuri because um, I need, you know, some volunteers to help. And he has been great. Now, without his support, the concept of nanoartography would never even been realized. So we as an advisor, I always tell my colleagues that we need to listen to our, our graduate students. And the graduate students, or even students at any level, they need to share their ideas and don't be afraid of sharing these even crazy ideas because without these crazy ideas, we wouldn't provide new opportunity for the next generation. So that's basically a little bit of background, also advice to both uh, my colleagues and students. Now for, for nano-artography, um, every year we have the submission deadline 
to be as uh, September 30th. And uh, it is open to everyone. Hopefully we'll have even images that anyone can take and add um, you know, their taste of art and submit. Everyone can submit up to three images. So it's not only one, you can up, uh, submit up to three images. And um, the winners will be announced in November. Right now, um, I try to have the maximum um, basically even cash uh, reward because I know all the students, even small amounts of cash have been uh, in that level and I know how important it is. So right now, the first place is 1,000 US dollars, and which in my lifetime of winning all these awards, I've never uh, won a $1,000, you know, like in the hundreds. Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I was able to raise funding to bring it to this level. And it only will grow. Also, we have a people choice, which is another way to bring more visibility to this competition. That right now we do it through Facebook because that's the only way that we can count all the likes. Uh, we might modify that and use a different platform, but right now it is uh, people choice is basically an image that gets the most uh, Facebook likes. And uh, that is a way also to promote nano artography to those who. Um, really have no connection to any science um, background folks and they just see this image and like it and you will get uh, $500 as a people choice winner. And we have the uh, second and third place and usually we have multiple second and third uh, uh, places. Um, so more awards. Awesome. And then where can uh, our listeners go to learn more about uh, this competition? So what, one thing I made sure at the beginning was to create a unique name for nano photography <laughs> that there is really no background in search engine. And that was also, <laughs> also thanks to Yuri Gugasi and his team because we were like brainstorming what name should we come up that there is really like, like mm -hmm. it's sciences art, nano art, they're all known. So uh, one of the, at the time, PhD students, Kathleen Maleski, she came up with the name nano photography. She is now a PhD. And uh, it's a unique name. So all you need to do is just Google nano artography. And um, the first um, search result would be nanoartography.org, which is the, the website. And all the information you need is available on, on the website. So just Google nano artography. Perfect. Well, thank you so much, Babak, for joining us today. It was an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you for having me. As a materials engineer, we can make an impact in nearly every single industry. But with that versatility comes a lot of different options to choose from. So if you have no idea which industry or position is right for you, believe me, you're not alone. I've been there, done that. But just for a moment, imagine narrowing down your ideal role and company by the end of this week. Imagine being able to secure your dream job offer without having to apply to hundreds of job openings. Our online course, MSE Academy, includes video testimonials, resumes, interview prep, and mentorship from materials engineers who have been in your shoes. We also connect our members with companies and industry professionals in our expansive network to help accelerate your job search as much as possible. To learn more and get started, simply click the link in the description below. And if you enroll within the next 24 hours, we'll add three bonus career development resources. I hope to see you there.